Welcome back to Court TV's continuing coverage of the state of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin. So far this morning, we've heard from the ER doctor who was a resident at the time um, who treated George Floyd. And then it was the chief of police. Chief Arredondo has been on the stand this morning and spending a lot of time talking about the uh, department policies, what officers are expected to do. And one of the things that he talked about was the fact that on every single call that his men and women go out to, they have to be on their game. Our officers are being called, particularly patrol officers are being called to, again, uh, respond in a way to our community's needs. And it's hundreds of thousands of calls that they respond to. And, um, you know, we are a very interesting profession in that to some professions, your body of work matters. And to an extent, within the Minneapolis Police Department, our body of work matters, but it's more internally. Um, but to our communities, for the most part, your body of work doesn't hold as much value. Um, we don't have the luxury of being able to go up to a community member for the first time and say, you know, those 99 calls I was on before went really well. Trust me on this one. We don't have the luxury of doing that. Our communities are going, no, what have you done for me lately? This interaction, I'm going to grade you on how you treat me uh, during this call, during this interaction. And so, um, so we have to make each engagement with our community count. And so uh, the training is very important. Uh, because for many in our communities, the first time that they encounter a Minneapolis police officer may be the only time in their life they do. And so that, that singular incident matters. Time for the Daily Sidebar. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who's live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Court TV anchors Julie Grant and Michael I.L. Uh, Chanley, this is not the only member of the Minneapolis Police Department that the jury has seen or will see, and that's a bit of a point of contention with the defense. It certainly is. In fact, the defense wanting to put on the record this morning that the, the judge has previously ruled to limit the testimony and opinion from non-experts on the police force to speculate about whether or not they believed what happened to George Floyd was proper, according to Minneapolis Police Department policy and procedures. And the judge even agreeing to a certain extent that some of it may be cumulative. We're expecting to hear from a couple of more officers with the Minneapolis Police Department, the one ahead of training, as well as others to talk about what is in place and policies and whether or not Derek Chauvin followed proper policy. The chief, though, arguably one of the most important, I mean, he is the chief of police of the Minneapolis Police Department. More than 30 minutes, Ted, was spent on his background and his experience on the police force, so much so to build up his credibility in front of this jury where he's now outlining specific policies where he will ultimately say that the conduct of Derek Chauvin didn't follow policy of the police department. Julie, Prosecutor Schlischer is taking his time with this witness because this is one of those witnesses that you want to be part of the courtroom for an extended period of time uh, just because of who he is. Yeah, it's a, a definitely, and, and I think he ought to speed it up. And, <laughs> you know, there was one point where he asked a question, uh, talking about Derek Chauvin, and he said, Do, are you aware of who this person is? <laughs> I want to say, come on. It's like saying, are you aware that uh, the Pope's Catholic? I mean, come on. Like, get to the point. Be precise. Look, he's the chief for a reason. He has a beautiful resume. He could have done that 30 minutes by just saying, chief, welcome. Please tell the jury about your background. And let the chief talk about, sure, I started in 1989. I went through the academy, went from patrol to sergeant to lieutenant, and just all the way up the ranks, and here I am today. You can very succinctly do that. And my guess is the reason why he went so long is because the Chief's really likable. He's really easy to understand. He's great with the jury. He comes off really personable, like the kind of guy you just want to invite over your house for dinner. So I think their whole point is let's just keep him up there for a while. But uh, it, it's what I've been preaching all along, precision. A, both sides have to be a little more precise, in my opinion, Ted. He's also a local celebrity, Michael, especially given the aftermath after what happened after George Floyd's death. Um, he was on the hot seat, right, because the, the city was burning, third precinct was on fire. Um, this is a guy that every single, I guarantee you, every member of that jury knows him, has seen him on television. Um, but to Julie's point, is this getting to be too much? 
You know, I, I think Julie certainly has a point. Um, at the end of the day, though, um, I think what they're trying to do, and it's a fine line, because you can certainly go on and on, and I think they're getting close to that point. But by setting him up the way they are, and really, because, again, he's such a great witness, uh, very experienced, so well-spoken, has so, many, uh, so much knowledge about the department, it's going to add to his impact when they get to the testimony that they're most interested in about whether the use of force in this case was reasonable or according to department policy. So they want to build it up, create this relationship with the jury, let them see and understand who this man is, so that when he says what they want him to say, it has maximum impact. But Again, they're getting up to that line, so we'll see if that comes real soon. Yeah. Before the chief took the stand, uh, Dr. Langenfeld was on the stand, and this was the physician that worked on George Floyd. This was the man that tried to save George Floyd's life, and it was an exhaustive effort, um, to be sure. Let's listen to him talk about the moment that he pronounced George Floyd dead. Uh, did you pronounce him uh, formally uh, dead? Yes. Uh, at the time you pronounced him dead, was he still in some degree uh, in uh, PEA or asystole in terms of describing his heart? I, I think it's probably best to think of these as sort of a spectrum um, where PEA is some degree of electrical activity still running through the heart, but the heart's not pumping. Um, and then eventually that will devolve into a systole where both the heart is not pumping and then the electrical activity stops as well. And so at the end of the case, um, the Mr. Floyd was still in PEA, but there was virtually no cardiac activity. Um, and and at that point, in, in the absence of any apparent reversible cause, and because Mr. Floyd had been in arrest for, by this time, 60 minutes, I determined that the likelihood of any meaningful outcome was far below 1%, and that we would not be able to resuscitate Mr. Floyd. And so I then pronounced him dead. Chanley, Dr. Langenfeld uh, wasn't uh, a full physician at that point. He was still a resident when he was in charge. Well, not in charge. He was um, overseeing the other junior residents in the emergency room on the night that George Floyd was brought to the Hennepin County Medical Center. Right, but boy, he sounded very experienced on the witness stand today, talking about certain medical terms, defining them without hesitation. And But yet, at one point when the judge based him to ask him to speak in English, please, because we don't know all these medical terms. Uh, he was able to explain it in a more of a layperson way where we could understand and follow. And he had some really key points for both the prosecution and the defense. He talked about how he eliminated what possible causes of the cardiac arrest could be for George Floyd, ultimately leading him to the conclusion that it was a lack of oxygen or asphyxia. The first time the prosecution has put that before this jury as possible cause here for what happened to George Floyd. We learned the extensive measures that they undertook. But again, on cross-examination, we see Eric Nelson trying to turn that towards more to their theory, which is the intoxication and the drug use side of things. And Michael, he did bring um, Eric Nelson on cross, uh, get his point across, because the, the um, hypoxia that creates the um, the issue that he had with um, with, both, with with the elevated um, CO2 and the fact that he wasn't getting enough oxygen um, to his brain that Eric Nelson did a great job of solidifying it on cross by saying, yeah, but also this could be caused by not only meth, but by fentanyl. Correct. And, you know, to this doctor's credit, he was very succinct, as Chanley said, and very clear. And the answer there was absolutely yes. Yeah, absolutely. That was the key on that cross-examination. This idea that plays into the defense's idea of how he died was that it was, in fact, a drug overdose or induced by the drugs taken by uh, George Floyd. And he got him to answer exactly the way he wanted him to. Stopped. I mean, he was really great in terms of stopping the questioning, stopping him from going on. Of course, on redirect, he was able to explain a little bit more on a couple of questions. But at the end of the day, uh, I think it was in a very, very effective cross-examination, really undercutting some of the information 
information that the prosecution wanted to get out. Because if you remember, what the prosecution promised in their opening statement was they were going to bring in doctors and, and experts who were going to explain that the cause of death could not match up to an overdose, that the conditions in the body would suggest that it was another form of death, and a, that death, of course, being uh, through lack of oxygen, and oxygen or asphyxia. So he was helpful there, but I think some points scored by the defense. A bit undermined there, Julie. Uh, and the point that there was was... He was rehabilitated on redirect, and that was over the Narcan, right? The, the right. Nelson says, hey, you didn't give him Narcan, you didn't give it to him. Uh, and then it, you know, uh, he tried to get it out, but then on redirect, yeah, because it wasn't going to help, right? And, exactly. But, but he did get the Narcan out there, right? It, 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 and that's talking mm -hmm. about drug use. You got it, Ted. Bingo. And so mission accomplished there, even though things were evened out, as you said, by the prosecutor, Jerry Blackwell, saying, well, if somebody's in cardiac arrest, then it wouldn't have helped. But I think what Eric Nelson is going to do later on is go back to the fact that police did not administer Narcan, or the, uh, the lab name is naloxone, if you hear that. And so it's the opioid reversal drug. It's really easy to administer. It's spray up the nose. It's foolproof. If somebody is overdosing, it's, it's, it's an amazing drug. It really is. And one thing I would like to know is whether these four officers were carrying Narcan that day, if they had it on them, if they could have administered it to George Floyd, because that could really be a game changer, Ted, as I see it. And I think that's why Eric Nelson is laying the groundwork, trying to put those buzzwords in the jury's ears, fentanyl, Narcan, methamphetamine, overdosing, heroin, all that, because he's laying the groundwork, the foundation for the defense. We know this is going to be a very active defense once the state rests its case in chief. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, we'll see where it goes with the other experts that Michael talked about, because we are going to hear other doctors come in that are medical experts opining on both sides, whether or not drugs could have caused George Floyd's death. All right, that'll bring to an end another edition of the Daily Sidebar. Thank you all to uh, my colleagues. We're going to step aside, take a break. Much more ahead. The jury is on their lunch break. And we'll get you back into the courtroom as soon as they're back for more live coverage. There's the seal of the great state of Minnesota. Stay with us. We'll be right back.